sports, people from all over the world setting their differences aside and coming together in the spirit of friendly competition. Well, isn't that a lovely idea? At least in theory. In reality though, the actual competition is who can sell the biggest chunk of their soul to corporations. But it's not all doom and gloom, humanity still loves sports. And while I do cringe every time some sweaty jock is trying to sell me a car or his own brand of stink water, at the very least all of this corporate chilling has given us some decent video games over the years. I mean, if the sports industry didn't love selling out so much, we might have missed out on excellent games like NBA Jam and Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey. But as is the case with most businesses, being popular with your target audience wasn't good enough. No, 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 you also have to sell your games to people who are not actually interested in sports. And that's where we enter the weird realm of what I like to call not quite sports games. To illustrate what I mean, let's start with the most famous example of this, um, genre, I guess. A little game known as Shaq Fu. Shaq Fu is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game like Street Fighter or King of Fighters, only instead of some legendary martial artist, the main character of this one is basketball superstar Shaquille O'Neal. I guess someone must have thought this sounded like a good idea at some point, but time has definitely proven that person wrong. I've more than once seen Shaq Fu referenced as the worst video game of all time. Now that's an opinion I absolutely don't agree with. I wouldn't even put it in the top 10 worst fighting games of the 16-bit generation. But the fact still remains that Shaq Fu is not a very good game. At a quick glance the game doesn't look so bad, the music is fairly nice and the graphics are actually really great. The characters have way more frames of animation than what was standard for console fighting games at the time. And the backgrounds are not only well made, but also contain a lot of animation themselves, as well as at least a couple of layers of parallax scrolling. The game also has an appropriately cheesy story, where Shaq travels to an alternate dimension to save a kid from an evil mummy. So far everything sounds like good stupid fun, but where the game falters is in the gameplay. The aforementioned smooth animations, while awesome in theory, actually makes the controls feel very delayed and sluggish, which you will probably recognize as a pretty big problem for a fighting game. And from what I've heard it's even worse in the American version. I'm not sure why, but I'd guess it's because the game was made in Europe, so perhaps it wasn't properly balanced for the American NTSC standard. And hey, speaking of balance, it's pretty important to have balanced characters in a fighting game, right? Well, this game doesn't. To be fair, there are fighting games with worse balance, but let's just say I don't expect this game to turn up in the EVO tournament anytime soon. In single player mode this doesn't really matter though, since even if the game was perfectly balanced, the AI would still have an unfair advantage. Not only does it have the unfair AI that you would expect from a bad fighting game, but the computer players also don't have to wrestle with the bad controls like the players do. So while you make your 7th or 8th unsuccessful attempt at a special move that you do know the button combo for, the computer player has probably already hit you with a whole bunch of their own special attacks. Not that the game is great with a human opponent either, but at least then both players are at the same disadvantage. One interesting thing about Shaq Fu is that it actually has a violence code similar to the original Mortal Kombat on Mega Drive. Now don't expect to be able to rip out Shaq's spine or anything here, the violence is still relatively mild. But the code does add a little bit of blood to the fighting, and it also lets you perform slightly more graphic finishing moves. Though again, absolutely nothing on Mortal Kombat fatality levels. Even though the game's cheesy premise does have some charm to it, I really can't recommend Shaq Fu to anyone. But if you do get it, definitely go for the Mega Drive slash Genesis version. The Super Nintendo version does have better music, but pretty much everything else is worse. The Mega Drive version has slightly more detailed graphics, more stages and above all else, almost twice as many playable characters. 
but if you happen to have the oddly specific urge to play a game starring a basketball superstar that's not a basketball game, then I have a much better suggestion for you. And that is Michael Jordan Chaos in the Windy City. As you probably already guessed, you played the game as MJ himself. I mean the MJ that doesn't go CHAMAUNA! And the goal of the game is to save the rest of the Chicago Bulls who have been kidnapped by a mad scientist. The game itself is a platformer with fairly big open levels. The goal of each level is to find one of your kidnapped teammates, as well as finding the way to the level exit. In order to do this you need to find various colored keys. These open up doors that contain power-up items, and sometimes also one of your teammates. The keys are also necessary to unlock new paths that let you progress further into the levels. Like any good platformer, there's also a variety of different hazards and enemies that will get in your way, the latter of which can be disposed of by throwing various types of basketballs at them. Yeah, according to standard video game logic, since Michael is a basketball player, the only way he could possibly attack is by throwing basketballs. Your standard attack are normal basketballs, but you can also find various elemental versions such as fire and ice balls. You can also find basketball hoops spread out over the levels, which you can slam dunk to gain even more power-ups. Just like Shaq Fu, the game's presentation is actually surprisingly nice. Both Michael and the enemies are well animated, and the backgrounds are nice and detailed, though occasionally lacking a bit in color. And the soundtrack is also really good, not exceptionally fantastic, but certainly a lot better than what you would expect from a game like this. The only major flaw I can find with the presentation is the painful advertisement for Wheaties cereal and Gatorade, which serve as the game's health power-ups. Chaos in the Windy City might not be an all-time classic for the Super Nintendo, but it's certainly a big step above what you would expect from a Michael Jordan platformer. I mean, compared to Shaq Fu, this is pretty much like finding the Holy Grail. This might be partially because this game was the design debut of the fantastic Amy Hanning, who would later become the lead writer and director for the Amazing Legacy of Cain series, as well as the original Uncharted trilogy. But now let's step away from basketball and move on to golf. Like a lot of basketball players actually. Here's one of the most interesting exclusive games for the oft forgotten Atari 7800, Ninja Golf. This game is a lot less cynical than the last two. It wasn't made to cash in on some sports star celebrity. It's simply a fun idea that feels like it was made because it was a fun idea. I would give you a brief synopsis of what the game is about, but this time I feel like I'm doing you a disservice if I don't read it straight from the game itself. After many long years of ninja training, you are finally ready for the most difficult test of all. Nine holes of ninja golf. Hell yes. It's things like this that are the reason video games exist. So, the game itself is basically divided into three parts. First is the golf part. This uses an extremely simple golf mechanic where you first set the direction you want to aim the shot. After that you have to stop a marker where you want the ball to land. But as soon as the marker reaches full power it resets back to minimal power. So the only strategy comes from trying to get the ball as far as possible without risking going over the top and getting a pathetically weak swing instead. After shooting the ball you move on to the action part. In this mode you run in a straight line across the golf field trying to reach the point where your ball landed. This mode plays pretty much like Kung Fu on the NAS. It's a very simple beat em up where you just run straight forward and defeat any enemies that happen to get in your way. There are a couple of power ups you can pick up such as a potion that refills part of your health and a shuriken that lets you attack enemies from a distance a couple of times. One neat feature is that the environment changes based on the hazards on the golf course. So for instance when you run through a bunker it changes to a desert environment. And of course like any real golf course the bunkers are full of cobras and the water hazards are full of great white sharks. Once you reach the green the game changes into the third and final mode. This mode uses a behind the shoulder view and you have to use your shurikens to defeat a dragon that is guarding the green. Once the dragon is defeated you automatically win the current hole, no putting required. 
You get awarded some bonus points based on how many strokes the current level took you to beat and then you simply move on to the next course. Graphically the game looks pretty good by 7800 standards. The sprites are at least somewhat detailed and the backgrounds even have some neat looking fake parallax scrolling. The sound isn't quite as impressive, but you can't really expect too much since the 7800 used the same outdated sound chip as the 2600. I could have done without the scratchy sound effect you get every time you take a footstep in the game, but at least the rest of the sound effects are fine. And even though there's no actual in-game soundtrack, at least you get a few cute musical cues here and there. Such as that classic Egyptian song that everyone has heard but no one knows the name of, which plays every time you enter a bunker in this game. Ninja Golf is a very simple game, but it's good fun and has a great sense of humor. So if you happen to own a 7800, it's really a must-have title for the system. Next up is a game that might be cheating a bit since it's not actually based on a sport, but rather a sporting event. But heck, let's do it anyway. And the game is Isis Quest for the Olympic Rings. In 1996 the Olympic Games were held in Atlanta, and since the Olympic Committee is both as evil and as incompetent as the Umbrella Corporation, they created this hideous mascot so they could sell their merchandise to kids. And when merchandising to kids of course you gotta have a video game. Isis Quest for the Olympic Rings is for the most part an extremely generic platformer, but it seems like the game was co-developed by some aliens from an alternate dimension where fun means the exact opposite as it does here on Earth. So the Earth developer said, hey those transformations in the Mario games are pretty popular, let's have those in our game. And then the aliens said, okay but in that case you can't jump while you have the power-ups activated. And then the humans said, hmm, players like smooth responsive controls, our game should have that. And the aliens replied, hmm, okay, but then the game has to have extreme slowdown everywhere. And you can only damage enemies if you do a short jump and not a long jump. So the humans said, well, the ring-based health system in Sonic the Hedgehog is pretty clever. Let's have a similar health system in our game but using Olympic medals instead. Fine, the alien said. But in that case you can't recollect the medals once you lose them, and you have to collect an arbitrary number of them before you can take damage again. And there should also be a whole bunch of different enemies and traps that you can barely distinguish from the game's backgrounds. <clears throat> I think you get what I mean here. It had potential to be an at least decent game, but there's a whole bunch of flaws and bad design decisions that drag it down. At the very least, the game does have a somewhat decent soundtrack, and the graphics are technically well made even though they're not very visually appealing. The developers must have really liked the graphics though because they added an animation test to the options menu, the same way that many other games has a sound test option. There was also a version of Easy for the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis. I don't own that version because hell I'm not paying for this game twice. But from what I can tell it's the same game only with much much uglier graphics. Is is not the worst game out there but it might be better if it was because then at least there would be something interesting about it. As it stands it's just a really boring average platformer. So this is definitely one you can skip with good conscience. Now let's move on to football aka soccer. I've not exactly made a secret of the fact that this sport bores me to tears, but then again these are not standard football games. Which is good for me because there's surprisingly many of these not football football games. Let's start with what is probably the most famous example, Soccer Kid, or Kid Cleats as it's known in the United States for some reason. As the not stupid version of the title would imply, you play the game as a kid who is a big football fan. The goal of the game is to travel the world and find the pieces of the Football World Cup trophy, which has been stolen and broken to pieces by an evil alien. Hey, at least it's nice to know that not all evil aliens are overambitious and want to take over the entire universe or something. Some of them just want to steal some tacky trophy. Meh, they can keep it for all I care. Gameplay wise, Soccer Kid is a platformer. The first release of the game was for the Commodore Amiga, and you can definitely tell that that was the case. 
everything from how the controls and physics work to how the levels are laid out just feels very Amiga. It's a bit hard to explain, but if you have played any other popular platformer for the system then you probably know what I mean. Anyway, the unique hook of Soccer Kid is your weapon, which is, well, a football. As expected, you can kick it at your enemies to attack them, but you can also perform a whole bunch of other neat tricks. For instance, you can kick it diagonally to get it over obstacles, or you can bounce it on your head to get to things above you, and you can even bounce on top of the ball to reach higher platforms. If the ball gets stuck somewhere or if it's far away and you're too lazy to go and get it, then all you need to do is hold down the shoot button and the ball will automatically warp back to you. And you'll need to use all of these tricks not just to make it through the game, but also to find all the football trading cards hidden throughout the levels, and you need to find all of these to get the game's true ending. This can be a bit tricky, but at the very least there's a handy counter in the user interface that shows how many cards are left in the current level. When it comes to the presentation, Soccer Kid has some nice colorful cartoony graphics. Maybe not among the best of the 16-bit generation, but it's definitely appealing. And it also has a really nice bouncy soundtrack. One really neat feature is that by pressing the L and R buttons on the title menu, you can change the colors of Soccer Kid's uniform. So if you happen to be a fan of a particular football team, you can make him wear that team's colors. Soccer Kid is definitely a way better game than it has any right to be. I wouldn't call it an all-time masterpiece, but it's definitely a good game and it has a strong cult following. Which is evident by the fact that it was ported to both the Game Boy Advance and PlayStation 1 almost 10 years after its original release. There's even an unofficial port to the Atari Jaguar of all things. Now let's have a look at another game that has more than a few things in common with Soccer Kid. A game called Marco's Magic Football, or just Marco in North America. This game stars a young football fan predictably named Marco. At the start of the game, Marco overhears the diabolical schemes of an evil toy maker, who plans to use his generic 90s mutagen ooze to turn innocent animals into his mutant slaves. Using said slaves, he plans to take over the entire... Uh, town of North Surlington, England. I guess it must have been tradition for these games to have such unambitious villains. But Marco isn't really down with the idea of his hometown being taken over. So luckily his football happens to come into contact with the mutant ooze, which of course gives the ball magical properties. Because that's how chemistry worked in the 90s. Gameplay wise, Marco's magic football is very very similar to Soccer Kid. I'd even say suspiciously similar. Other than the fact that Marco has a dedicated run button, his move list is pretty much identical to that of Soccer Kid. Even down to things like being able to bounce on top of the ball or holding down the shoot button to teleport the ball back to you. Soccer Kid did come out a bit before Marco, but the releases were so close to one another that I'm not sure I can accuse Marco of being a ripoff. I personally think that the controls feel a little bit tighter in Soccer Kid, but it's not a huge difference. One part where this game wins out though is the presentation. It has a similar aesthetic to Soccer Kid, but the graphics are noticeably more detailed here, and the color palette especially is way more vibrant and appealing in this game. I also prefer the soundtrack here, but that one's more of a personal preference. I played the Super Nintendo version here, but the game is also available on the Mega Drive and Game Gear. There's a version for the Mega CD as well, but that one is really expensive and the game is not that good. I honestly can't decide whether I prefer Marco's Magic Football or Soccer Kid, but I'd recommend you give at least one of them a try. And if you enjoy that one, then give the second one a chance as well. You may be tired of hearing me compare these two games by now, but I have to mention one more thing that they have in common. They were both made to cash in on the 1994 FIFA World Cup, 
This was actually held in the United States, and because of that it was perhaps the only time in human history where the US gaming market gave a crap about football games. Well, I mean actual football, not hand egg. Of course, a huge marketing opportunity like this didn't just lead to video games. There was tons of other merchandising as well, including a football cartoon series known as the Hurricanes. And this cartoon itself got not just one, but two different video game adaptations, neither of which is an actual football game. Let's start by having a look at the Super Nintendo version. Once again, the game is a platformer where your weapon is a football, though it's a much more traditional platformer than Marco and Soccer Kid. You can still perform a few different types of shots, but the ball won't bounce around like, well, a ball. Instead, the ball will go straight in the direction you shoot it, and once it's gone as far as it can, it will automatically boomerang back to you. You can also pick up some power-ups that give the ball special abilities, such as turning it into an iron ball or an exploding ball. But sadly, each of these power-ups can only be used a couple of times, so you rarely get much use out of them. Apart from the choice of weapon, there's really not much that differentiates this game from other generic platformers. Everything from the enemies and environments to the layout of the levels feels very by the numbers for a 90s platformer, but at the very least it's overall a well-made game. But it does have a couple of features that I found pretty annoying that I do think drag the game down a bit. Instead of gradually gaining momentum with your movement like you do in most platformers, you will start moving really slow and then all of a sudden start running at full speed. There is a way to start running right away, but to do that you need to move with the L and R buttons instead of the D-pad, and as you can probably guess that doesn't feel very natural. The creators also tried to add some funny cartoon logic to the game by making your character stop in mid-air when you run over an edge, you know, Wily e. Coyote style. This is a nice idea in theory, but it really really gets in the way when trying to fight enemies that are located below you. I can't even count how many times I tried to drop down to attack only to stop in mid-air and land on top of the enemy instead. And it's not like the stop gives you any advantages, you can't jump while you're standing in mid-air, so it's just a pointless delay. Of course, you can circumvent this by jumping down through the platform instead, but it's still annoying. On top of this, the game also cheats. The game's second boss could have super easily been defeated by one of your shots, and I guess the developers caught this, but instead of fixing the boss, they just removed that particular shot during that boss battle, even though you can use it in other boss battles. It's not really a huge problem, but it's just one of those small things that make the developers look lazy. Other than these problems though, it's a fairly fun little platformer. The game looks fairly nice too. From what I've seen of the cartoon itself, it might actually look better than the source material even. That's not really saying much though, considering the cartoon's budget seems to have been somewhere between the Zelda CDI cutscenes and an episode of the Flintstones. Still, it is a pretty good looking game. It's also nice that you're given a choice of two different playable characters. They both play exactly the same, but it's still appreciated nevertheless. Though since there are two player characters, it's a bit sad that there's no simultaneous multiplayer. There is a two player mode, but it's just two players taking turns. So, all things considered, The Hurricanes was a pretty decent game on the SNES. Now let's have a look at the Mega Drive version and see how the competition measures up. As was often the case at the time, the Super Nintendo and Mega Drive version are actually two completely different games. The basic gameplay is still pretty much the same, it is still a football platformer, but there are some slight differences. The controls have been simplified a bit compared to the SNES version, which I actually think is a good thing. Now there wasn't really anything that felt wrong with the controls in the SNES version. But for instance, if you wanted to shoot the ball diagonally in that game, you had to hold down the shoot button and then push the direction you wanted to shoot the ball. And if you wanted to lob the ball, that was done with a completely different button from your standard shot. Again, this wasn't really a problem in the SNES version, 
But on the Mega Drive all you need to do is push the direction you want to shoot the ball, press the button and there you go. Which does admittedly feel a whole lot more intuitive. The ball in this version also acts a bit more ball-like. It does actually bounce around the environment a bit once you shoot it, though it will still return to you if you push the shoot button again or if it falls outside of the screen. And again I think this feels a bit more natural than the boomerang ball on the SNES version. In this game you also get a choice between 4 playable characters compared to the 2 on the Super Nintendo, though all the characters do still play exactly the same. And the 2 player mode is still only 1 player at a time. Where the Super Nintendo version gets the upper hand though is the presentation. The game doesn't look terrible, but it certainly can't compare graphically to its Super Nintendo counterpart. What I found pretty cool with the graphics in this game though is that in some stages there seems to be a completely different level in the background. You can't get to these levels or anything, but it's just a neat idea that makes the game world feel a bit bigger. The Super Nintendo version also sounds a lot better, but I can only think of like 2 or 3 games in existence where the Mega Drive beats the Super Nintendo sound wise, so I can't really fault this game for that one. The Super Nintendo just has a far superior sound chip. Apologies to any Sega Super fans, but deep down inside you do know that it's true. But if you're only going to play one version of the Hurricanes, then I'd actually still say that the Mega Drive version is the better option. It just feels slightly more well thought out gameplay wise. But now I think it's time to move on to today's final game. And if two basketball players got to star in their own non-sports game, then at least one football player must have done the same, right? And who could be more suited for this than the man who has sold more of his own dignity than he has sold seats at the football stadium? I am of course talking about David Beckham. Now this dude did have an actual football game named after him, but that's not what we're playing here. No, we have something much better to look forward to. A platformer for Game Boy Advance called Go Go Beckham Adventure on Soccer Island. Now, would you believe me if I said that a low-budget portable platformer from the early 2000s starring David Beckham is actually a really good game? Well, believe it or not, but it actually is a really good game. By far the best game I'll talk about in this episode, actually. You, of course, play the game as Beckham himself, or rather a very cartoonified version of him. The goal of the game is to save the titular soccer island from the evil Mr. Woe. It's a simple generic plot, but that's really for the best with a game like this. So what about the gameplay then? The game is once again a platformer where you use a soccer ball to attack enemies and solve simple puzzles. It's kind of hard to believe that such a weird concept has been used this many times. However, it's never been done this well before. The controls are absolutely spot on, especially when it comes to kicking the ball. And the levels are very well designed around the football mechanic, providing a decent challenge without ever becoming too frustrating for young or inexperienced players. The main goal of each level is to use your football to open a number of locks. Doing this will unlock the level's goal ring. Once this is done, all you need to do is kick your ball into it and the level will be beaten. However, each level also has a number of hidden collectibles, so there's always a bit of incentive to go back and explore previously beaten levels. As you progress through the game you'll also unlock a few extra abilities, such as being able to warp the ball back to you after you shoot it. But now let's address the elephant in the room here. This game looks really nice, but the reason for this is that it pretty much completely rips off the art style of Yoshi's Island even right down to the island on the title screen. And of course while it does look good, it's not nearly as good as its inspiration. I'm not really mad though, at the very least they choose a beautiful game to rip off. And the game does have enough unique good things to stand on its own merits. It's definitely worthy of being called one of the GBA's hidden gems. And that's all the games I have for you this time. Kind of hard to believe how many sports games there are without sports in them, and I'm sure there are several more out there that I have never played. 
So if you know about any, please let me know and maybe I'll do another episode on this topic another time. But for now, have a good one and I'll see you again next time.